Welcome to another episode of Tech Society, a bi-weekly podcast that offers a cohesive picture of what's happening in the ever-changing world of technology and modern society. Now your hosts, Alex Stunmo and John Newen. And before we begin this episode, just quickly, is it time for your business to evolve? Yes, it is. So come see Ninja Software, njs.dev. All right, let's get into the episode. Hey there, techies. Welcome to another episode of Tech Society. Today, we are speaking with David Carter. David Carter is the CEO of the world's first carbon neutral commercial fishing company. He is Marine Stewardship Council's Lifetime Achievement Award winner and Austral Fisheries CEO. In this episode, he will reveal the state of Australia's seafood business. His professional achievements include integrating sustainable sourcing and production using environmentally responsible fishing practices battling illegal fishing and building globally recognized seafood brands. David Carter not only talks the talk when it comes to a sustainable future, he also walks the walk. In this episode, you'll learn how Dave is doing his part to combat climate change, the appetite from the public for a sustainable future, and how blockchain provides transparency and how he uses technology to gain an edge over cheaper offshore competitors. All right, this is going to be a good one. Let's get into it. Yeah, David Carter, um, the day job is CEO of Austral Fisheries, so that's um, it's a curious connection to tech and you guys. <laughs> um, been here all my life, so um, this job started as a um, deckhand on a prawn trawler 43 years ago. It's taken me on um, on a journey that's kept me interested the whole time, so um, from uh, yeah, deck of a boat through all of the various um, policy challenges, marketing challenges, uh, illegal fishing challenges, interacting with NGO challenges, and then in recent years, just that opportunity to um, kind of uh, be myself, manifest those things that are important to me, and um, and in the process, hopefully add shareholder value. Nice. Yeah. It, it, you say that um, there's a funny connection to tech, but Austral Fisheries actually like does do a lot of tech stuff, right? Yeah, a little bit of tech. A lot, lot um, of R&D in tech space. Yeah, the, the basic the basic fishery stuff is around um, say the the electrical side is um, the quality of the depth sounders and you know there's tech that's been involved in getting positional information right and then there's getting to understand where fish move so that that ends up being quite um, quite an analytical process. More recently, the kinds of things that we've done have been with product track and trace. So dive into some of the blockchain technology that allows us to. Oh, wow. make claims and have uh, those claims verified by a broader community connect customers with with the things that are important to us uh, that's an that's an important finishing piece for all the other work that we do hmm. i want to come back to all of that but let's just start with your history so how do you go from being on the deck to being in the ceo's office i often joke say, say to folks i've just been really shit at doing job interviews <laughs> <laughs> so, and it's kind of like now i'm the last man standing like 43 <laughs> years who else is who else is going to knock me off i don't know you could be you could be cynical about that but um no I've, I've i've enjoyed the opportunity this business is see the world uh and it, you know it's been it's been a privileged view because the industry is not that huge so you've been around long enough you get to connect with all those different um, characters and challenges involved in senate inquiries and the political processes of uh, resource access in the the challenge of markets so when you were on the deck did you have aspirations to thinking to yourself one day i'll be ceo no it did start that way so if we go back before that i was a uh, um studying science at melbourne university and got to the end of that degree and thought what am i going to do i you know, didn't really want to go and study to be a phd wasn't sure what the job prospects were uh, at the time australia was expanding its exclusive economic zone to to beyond 12 uh, 12 miles out to 200 miles and i thought uh, i'd like to do a bit of sailing and um, scuba diving <laughs> in bass strait and i thought well Fishing could be the go, right? I went to the uh, went to the local post the post office and waded through uh, all of the yellow pages that they had there. It's like you, you guys use Google now, <laughs> <laughs> but um, I ended up writing 
writing forty odd letters to all sorts of fishing companies that I found in, in the yellow pad in the yellow pages over that period. I got two only responses. So I was in Melbourne. The two responses were from Perth. The first interview was with uh, the late Michael Kalis. That didn't work out so well. And the second interview was with uh, the chap that came on to be came, uh, went on to become my um, mentor and sort of guide and boss for many years, uh, Murray France. And um, he said, want to be a trainee millionaire? There's a boat leaving Darwin in a week. So um, <laughs> I went home, packed my bags, had my, had my 21st birthday and um, flew to Darwin. And yeah, that was, that was a pretty huge culture shock. So that was November 20, uh, uh, 1979. Wow. Mm. Tell us a bit about the Sea Shepherd collaboration, which uh, we heard you talk about at the CEO Institute. Which is, it seems like a, a, a you know, what do they call that? Um, funny bedfellows or something mm, like that? Strange bedfellows. Strange bedfellows, thank you, yeah. Yeah, I like, um, I like to talk, talk to the idea of courageous collaborations. And I, I, um, I think there's, there's much to take away from that. But the, uh, um, the backstory for us is an operation that we have in the Southern Ocean for Patagonian toothfish. We've been operating there <coughs> since the late 1990s. Mm. And really, a feature of our operation there has been this illegal fishing pressure right through. We have become, even before Sea Shepherd, very effective at building political will, running uh, running campaigns, getting consensus across uh, various stakeholder groups, doing all sorts of amazing things. And that had been successful in routing out the worst of the illegal fishing pressures. Um, but there was still, and this was around... Uh, the middle of the, uh, so, so in the uh, 2015 period, uh, and there were still about six boats that were, were quite persistent in um, hunting illegally in that, across the Southern Ocean. So at this point, Sea Shepherd had um, been busy chasing Japanese whalers in the Southern Ocean. Uh, they had chosen to redirect that interest, uh, that energy to uh, toothfish, um, illegal fishing. And um, that got us a bit scared at the time. We thought, oh, this could be a problem. <laughs> <laughs> this, is a, this is a problem looking for us, uh, a solution looking for a problem. And uh, we, could be, we could be friendly fire because they've yeah. got a very effective uh, campaign oh, yeah, media yeah. machine and, um, and uh, their, voice, um, their voice carries. Um, but gradually we developed a relationship with Jeff Hansen locally here and um, he was uh, very quick to acknowledge the decade and a half of work that we'd done already in uh, eliminating illegal fishing. And so pretty quickly we, um, we found a, a real common purpose in trying to do something with snuffing out the last of that illegal fishing pressure. So we, uh, th- this was at the beginning of 2016, um, and at that, at that period they had just gone into the campaign in, in the areas south of Heard Island and discovered a vessel called the Thunder. Uh, she was one of the persistent bad bastards, um, and we wouldn't have—I would have given the chance of uh, uh, actually finding a boat in that vast o- ocean that's uh, really quite uh, small. Uh, but they did it, and um, and so they set about a, uh, a pursuit that ended up lasting for 110 days. Wow! Oh, so quite quite an extraordinary undertaking. So they they wandered sort of around in the ice, trying to miss. Um, well, the, the, the thunder was trying to shake them off through bad weather and through sea ice, <laughs> like all sorts of, through all sorts, um, or just swept them out, just drifting nowhere at the bottom of the Indian Ocean. Wandered up the, um, uh, the southern Africa, southern West African coast, um, and about that time we were delivering our vessel, the, the Atlas Cove, from Norway, where we'd bought her and converted her. She was moving down the African west coast and and we'd been having regular contact with um, with Jeff at this stage, updates on where they were at. And I said, Jeff, um, how do you feel about a um, a bit of on water support? And mm. like I was thinking, they're, they're going to be running out of food and fuel. Could we do anything? Mm. He said, No, no, we're sweet for that. Just a physical on water support would be like be really would be really powerful. And so I. Uh, I I then prepped our Japanese partners, and of course, there's, there's, there's a very cosy relationship not between Sea Shepherd and Japan. <laughs> um, so there was a, there was a bit of a bit of a shock and um, national silence. Tea. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I said, uh, "Trust me, she'll be right." Uh, I had a, I had a conversation with the skipper on the boat. I said, um, and he hadn't been privy to any of this backstory. But I said, "Steve, uh, you're going to think I'm crazy, but we wanted we want to do some work jointly with Sea Shepherd." Told him the story. This is work that. Um, that government and industry should be doing. And, you, mm. you know, an NGO is out here cleaning up our mess. So he got it really quickly. 
Um, I said, I'm not sure how the logistics are going to work. Hold, hold, hold your, car, um, your powder dry, and then we'll just watch how the how the pursuit develops. And it was all looking good. We got clearance from Tokyo. I gave Steve another call. I said, all systems go. Here's the number for uh, Peter Hammerstad on the uh, on the Sea Shepherd boat. You guys work out the logistics of your your uh, final approach, uh, which they did, and. Um, uh, it was it was a really powerful event. So there's yeah. a fantastic vision of um, uh, not just our boat and um, the Sam Simon, which was their second boat, had come in. So the uh, the skipper of the illegal fishing vessel wakes up this morning. There's three boats chasing him. If you uh, if your audience is keen, there's a thing called Chasing Thunder, which is um, a pretty special 90 minute documentary that oh, fantastic. shows all that out. But three days after that encounter. Um, the skipper of that vessel um, scuttled his own vessel called Mayday and um, <laughs> was rescued finally by uh, his pursuers, taken to um, where he where the crew were um, were prosecuted um, with Sea Shepherd's support, were found guilty and um, and did time. So um, it was it was really an extraordinary outcome. But what what it's done subsequently has been for us uh, with Sea Shepherd to collaborate vigorously on not just illegal fishing but uh, the other areas where we're in furious agreement, and that's in um, uh, greater climate action and uh, bringing more attention to the plight of um, uh, plastic pollution in our oceans. So it's like motherhood and apple pie, really. It's like what's not <laughs> to love about that cooperation? Uh, with the with you know, kind of being on the front lines of you know, plastic pollution in 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 our oceans, do you sometimes feel that? You know, when you talk to normal people on the street, that they they don't get it, that that they don't quite understand just how bad it is. Probably because it's it is so out of sight, out of mind. Yeah. You know, I, I, um, if we look at and it just it just shows up, and this is this is a bit my bias, but it shows up in the giving stats. So if we look at global giving for every for every ten dollars that that um, is donated to charities, one dollar makes it to the environment. Yeah. And a fraction of that makes it to the oceans. So it, it, this is this is perhaps a measure of how uh, the community psyche weighs up um, the kinds of the kinds of things that need to happen in the oceans. It's just viewed as so vast and out there and untouchable and maybe timeless, but the, the, the truth is really quite different. Are, are you seeing the impact of climate change like on your industry already? Is yeah, it? without doubt. Yeah, without doubt. What does that um, look like? Um, different jurisdictions, different things, but I mean, even talking out here now, you look at your recreational fishing guys, uh, there's now a marine heat, heat wave event happening off our west coast. Blue marlin are being caught off, off Rocknest Island, which is a truly rare event. So these are just events where more warm water comes south than it would be normal. Uh, in the past, that's messed with um, scallop spat survival rate, it's messed with uh, lobster productivity, it's messed with um, killing off mang of, uh, seagrass and kelp beds. The last heat wave event in 2015-2016 wiped out 10% of mangrove forests wow. in that uh, western Gulf of Carpentaria, which is important for our prawn business. We see broadly impacts of climate change, say, playing out in the, the, the northern hemisphere. So fish, fish are basically moving to the water where the temperature is familiar to them. So that's towards the poles. Mm. But some of these massive fish fisheries in the Northern Hemisphere are now uh, at risk of stranding assets as, as the fish move away from fish processing infrastructure and, uh, and fishing vessels have to travel further or, or indeed in the case of Northern Europe where you know, a, a capelin um, allowable catch could be allocated to Denmark and Norway um, only, only to be inaccessible because it's all gone to Greenland and Iceland. Yeah. So th these are having already massive impacts. As, um, I just want to jump on something you said before: carbon neutral. Tell us about carbon neutral fish. Ooh, you'll get to f you'll figure out. I do. I, I tell stories. Um, <laughs> it's more than just that. That's kind of the end game. But um, the whole commitment to climate action was um, has been it's like the evolution of a of a journey, a story, and. I think given my science background, the fact that of our 35 staff or so, seven science degrees in the in the team. So there's kind of a deep, deep sense that we need to know how these fisheries work before we can start to benefit, exploit, manage, sustain what's going on. And like right from the very beginning of my career, the, uh, the idea that understanding that resource is important, understanding the ecosystems that support those 
target species is important. Having the governance in ra arrangements in place that allow you to respond to variables in fishing pressure or climate, then um, that's the package. Mm. And then 20-odd um, years ago, we were, we were the first to embrace third-party certification for sustainability in fisheries, an international standard, one that's been, um, it's now it's visible in the, in the supermarkets as a blue tick. Um, it's global, the claim's clear, yep. and um, it's, I think it's, it has shifted the dial in terms of, of uh, sustainability for fisheries generally. And we were the, we were the first commercial um, supporters on the planet to sign up to that. So it was really simple for us. We're doing all the right things anyway. Yeah. We, want, we want some market recognition. Yeah. So yeah. the idea of presenting the consumer with the story about sustainability and saying um, reward that good practice in a way to improve uh, to demonstrate more good practice or the value of more good practice, then that, that, that's a pretty simple concept. Mm. What's not to love? But 20 odd years ago for the industry, that was kind of heathen talk. You know, it's like, <laughs> yeah. you're, you're feeding those evil greenies. Uh, that's what I was going <laughs> to ask. There must be, um, you must have run into conflict being you know, a captain of industry and then. Uh, yeah, and, careful. And, <laughs> <laughs> but then, um, yeah, I mean, uh, famously. Um, captains of industry are kind of uh, not been that supportive of uh, environmental action, right? I think it's it's starting to change, at least from a marketing perspective. But uh, it's, I think fake it till you make it, right? Mm, yeah. So carbon neutral fish is kind of, I think, from my understanding, like uh, for every fish, there's you know x amount of trees planted, right? Yeah. So uh, that uh, that journey begins, as I said, with the whole MSC thing. Yeah. We we pride ourselves in being progressive, standing up and talking to leadership. Uh, the whole battle with illegal, illegal fishing, again, was the same sort of thing. This is wrong. We need to address this. Yep. These policy levers need to be activated. And so we got to 2015, 2014, 2013. We just felt like what does a, like the rest of the world was catching up. So yeah. there was there was MSC certified fisheries everywhere. If you like, the leader's advantage was being eroded. So what do you do next? What does a progressive business do after that? So... Uh, that started started us inquiring more about what social license looks like in in fisheries, and uh, or in business generally. Um, a significant formative uh, experience for me was to watch the way the live cattle export business got shut down in 2011, with um, those poor practices in Indonesia and um, one Four Corners story, and 48 48 hours later, an arrogant billion dollar business was out of business. Yeah. So there but for the grace of God. And, um, and so put simply, for me, uh, the notions of s uh, social license in a, in a business is just, just look really honest, honestly at your own dirty little secrets yeah. and then do something about them. Tell the world what it is, where you stand on that. Acknowledge that you're not perfect, but these are the things that you're trying to, um, to do to address those, those concerns. And, um, and then we were presented with all these different solutions. So it could have been animal welfare in fisheries, could have been bycatch, could have been labour practices. Yep. Uh, we opted for emissions intensity. And, uh, and that was a bit of a personal thing, but the idea that um, we were seeing the changes in, in our world. If we were to be effective advocates for change, then we needed to be not just talking about it, but um, walking the talk. Yeah. And so the whole, the whole notion around, well, what, how can we make a virtue, it's, it's the leadership piece. Like, yeah. what can we do to get folks to, to be listen? ahead of the pack? And then, and then, you know, you see it gets tangled up in some of this Simon, Simon Sinek sort of thinking, like, what's your why, and um, and how's that going to uh, how's that going to serve the business? Mm. And you know, to me, it became really clear that we we're blessed with a number of premium seafood brands that allow us to connect and tell stories to our customers. And if in that process we're able to educate and inform and that consumers make a choice in our favour, then that we're happy. If they make a choice in another favour, that's okay too. But if we've been able to play our small part in educating um, our supply chain or those, those that interact with our brands, then I'm well pleased. Do you think there'll be, like a, the carbon market will actually appear on its own without kind of government um, forcing it so you can go and you know, just buy your carbon neutrality on an open market. You can already. Yeah? There is. A, uh, we oh, operate fantastic. in the voluntary market. Wow, cool. So we burn 9 million litres of diesel a year. 
Yeah. Um, Bruce has just done our emissions account. It's in the order of that's for the last year in the order of thirty eight and a half thousand tons. Uh, we will we will offset all of that emission through uh, nature based solutions. So that's um, basically planting trees, re establishing ecosystems. So these are not uh, abatement credits. So abatement credit is where you buy say uh, wind farm offsets. Yeah. So there's a there's a real difference here, right? So if you're putting a wind farm then you that's that's emissions that you're not putting out anymore. Yeah. Whereas mitigation credits are like planting trees. We you're sucking the um, the CO two back out of the out of the atmosphere. So um, one of the guiding principles for us was the idea that if we made the mess, we clean it up. Yeah. Um, planting sort of vast acreages of monoculture again is not right. You know, they just you're just replacing one desert for another. Um, but in Western Australia, we're blessed with blessed or cursed, but we're blessed um, in our case with a whole whole swath of um, the the, um, the eastern wheat belt, which is now salt affected, wind eroded, no longer commercial. Suffering the the impacts of climate change, increased um, summer rainfall over winter rainfall, and desperately needing um, uh, rehabilitation, and that's the commercial opportunity. Yeah. So it's the voluntary market that's able to step up, and um, and uh, invest I or, or provide a custom for those credits that are created from those enterprises, and um, everyone's a winner. I have a pointed question. Yes. Um, and and as a supporter of blockchain, I, I don't actually want to ask it, but I have to. Is this my it's, question? Is, no. it, is there not like an irony of um, you know, uh, climate change support, but also on the back of blockchain, which is currently really wasteful from an energy perspective? I believe we're um, running Ethereum here for what that's worth. <laughs> as long as it's got as a zero snarks. Or no, I have no idea what yeah. you're talking about now. <laughs> I, I, we, we I don't either. John does. I won't deep dive into the technicals, but I, I, I am interested to see how you reconcile the whole sustainability approach and uh, proof of work, which is what Ethereum currently runs on. Uh, it can be quite wasteful. Uh, th there are, there are peop very smart people trying to solve it, but today that it does use a lot of energy. Yeah, and, we'll, and uh, that that was one of my killer questions for later. But yeah. um, I think yeah. we're still we're still running it on um on a reduced distributed ledger, so it's yeah. um, it's not kind of <laughs> we we we've done something very similar for another company. We we uh, they export to China, beef right. to China, and uh, we help them with um, their blockchain like traceability for that. Right. And um, if you if you were to track every each individual thing on the blockchain, it's incredibly in expensive and intensive. But if you kind of bundle it all up into one signature, yeah. So we developed a um, and I'm kind of jumping in now, but uh, a manifest mm. of of all movements, mm -hmm. and we compress it into a single fingerprint, and put down the blockchain. Yeah, so you can um, you can keep the expense down if you're um, if you kind of handling these, it these guys. These guys are, are well aware of that the team yeah. is yeah, I'm sure they are between yeah. Sydney and Germany, and they um, yeah. And they claim to be platform agnostic and want to be yeah. transitioned to more efficient, more efficient um, protocols when that's available. Ethereum is definitely the the platform to be on for that. There's some big changes coming. Yeah, um, mm. we won't get into that now. But no, it's, um, kind of, it's kind of boring it's, it's for boring most people. Boring for everyone except me. Um, <laughs> but cool. but it's really cool <laughs> that you're doing stuff with the blockchain. And um, often we find uh, a lot of people want to do something on the blockchain, but the business case has to be usually. Um, multiple independent uh, organizations not quite trusting each other with their own data silos, but they want a single unified data store. Um, supply chain is a perfect example, which is why we've built um, supply chain platforms as well on the blockchain. It makes sense. And I think that's that's what we've got here too. I had a look at, um, so for our listeners, uh, Dave has given us a QR code. Mm, I took a photo. We'll put it on yeah. the, um, so you can, the description. You can scan the QR code. Uh, you can go to the link and you can actually view the journey, mm. uh, yeah. the journey of the catch, which yes. is pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, and, pretty the, and, and I guess the other, the other couple of co-benefits are the, the analytics that come from having, having folks scan these codes and understanding how much time they spend consuming what kind of content. Mm. That's not new to you guys. And then, particularly for the Chinese market, the um, yes. their fraud elements. Yep. Um, there are limits also, as you'd appreciate, with um, fraud control using these sorts of systems. But um, my view is that this technology allows us to really um, raise the red flag. So when there are problem problem issues, if the 
the code's been ripped off and it's been scanned 3,000 times, then that's a kind of a problem. Red flagged, yeah. Um, and we can, re re we can communicate, communicate that to the consumer. Um, we have some other technologies that are, in fact, Perth born and bred uh, from a business called Source Certain uh, that are using trace element fingerprints. Um, and that's using 60 trace elements really as, as a, um, an indicator of origin and provenance for these products. So we have a, we have a library of, of, uh, of known fingerprints across both the prawn fishery in the north and the toothfish fishery in the south. And the, and the beauty there is that when it comes to protecting our brands, we can take this blockchain kind of red flag, marry it with um, the uh, trace element fingerprinting and deliver um, a, a credible legal defense against yeah. fraud and ripoff. Wow, trace element fingerprinting, that's pretty hardcore. It's really cool. Yeah. Is that something that you've been familiar with for a while or is this like new cutting edge tech that you've... Mm, like yeah, a good like, question. Like a lot of things, like even like Block Ninja, you've been around a while, but you look like an overnight success right <laughs> it's a um what's yeah. the term a five-year overnight five-year five overnight success, overnight success. Yeah. <laughs> i think for source certain it's probably more like 15 years but um it's it's technology of world significance and for uh, supply chains of all sorts whether it's gold pearls eggs mm. fish um it's really powerful yeah and it's really important because we invest we invest truckloads in these brands and we want to yeah. make sure that customers get what they pay for and if we can't if we can't rely on that if we can't police that then um yeah people won't pay if they think it's going to be potentially a fraud yeah yeah we have one final question one killer question yeah we always end on a whimsical question uh, especially when you know it was um whiskey involved yeah that's right uh so i don't know if you're a fan of uh wrestling or ufc <laughs> but when the fighters come out you know the lights lights dim and the uh, fog machine starts and the song plays that um, you know, personifies their character, you know, sends the message to the crowd who that, who that fighter is. What is David Carter's intro song? So if you were to do TEDx again and they asked you, what song would you like to play before you came out on stage? What would it be? Blur. Woohoo, was that it? Oh, song two. Yeah. Blur that's song it. two. That's it. That's, that's yeah. Woohoo! Oh, yeah. Woohoo! Oh, yeah. yeah. Cool. All right. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> nice. You're feeling me. <laughs> Excellent. Not, Thank what's you. It, what's not to love, right? Cool. All right. Thanks, perfect. Dave. Great Good. choice. Good ah, lens, cheers. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks, David. Good work. That concludes this episode of Tech Society, and we hope you've come away with some useful knowledge. As always, come check us out at techsociety.fm or tweet us at techsociety if you have any comments you'd like to share. Ninja Software sponsors this episode, whom you can check out over at ninjs.dev.